Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, today's episode is all about what you can learn from your childhood claim to fame now in midlife. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle, with over a million downloads and counting. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach and midlife mentor, and I am so glad to be here with you again. The topic I want to coach you on today is what hidden gems are lurking in your memories about your big claim to fame when you were a kid. And I know you might be a little confused by this, by this topic, and that's okay. I'll get you through it. (laughs) The reason I want you to think about this is because of the whole what's my passion, what's my purpose conversation that you just may be having with yourself. I know you're going to love this little romp into your memories. I just know it. You got to trust me sometimes, right? (laughs) But just quick, before we dive into all of that, I want to make sure you know about the free online video training for you that's perfect if you wanna find out more about how to get unstuck and live your best life in the middle. Head over to www.midlifevideo.com and you'll get immediate access to what I like to call the secret to your midlife happiness plan. So my friend, if you are spinning on this whole passion and purpose thing, you are not alone. Just like so many other parts of this midlife experience, it's common to spin. It's common to be confused about a few things. It's common to feel stuck. And it's common to just not know things that you think you should have known by now that (laughs) that would have been way more clear by now at your age and stage of life. But for a variety of reasons, it's as clear as mud. (laughs) And I hear that all the time. And you're, you're not the only one. Believe me, you are not the only one. But the other thing that happens is you're not that nice to yourself about this topic of confusion either. You don't always know what you want. You don't always know what you should be doing. You don't always know what you're passionate about and what your purpose is. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that you think you should be clear on all of this stuff. And like I said, that's when Mean Girl comes out. You're hard on yourself for not knowing. And when it comes to the big P words, passion and purpose, there's really all kinds of confusion. I have found thinking about your childhood claim to fame and the memories that come from it, it kind of acts as a hack. Do you know what I mean? Are you familiar with a hack? It's a shortcut. And in this case, it can be a passion or purpose hack, a shortcut or sneak attack to insight about what you need more of in your life. So think of yourself conducting some passion and purpose reconnaissance, if you will. It's your mission. Should you choose to accept it, just play along with me. That's all you have to do. (laughs) Now, if you're a regular listener at this point in the episode, you may recall a free worksheet that I've mentioned before called the Passion Project 50. It also takes you back to your childhood. But in that case, you're looking for joyful moments to help you look for clues for more happiness and ways to express yourself, but your passion, ways to express your passion as an adult. Now, it is, like I said, it's similar but different, but it's also really fun. So if you want to grab your copy of that, just go to www.susierosenstein.com forward slash passion project 50. But for today, like I said, we are doing a little exercise that is a bit of a passion and purpose hack. (laughs) We're going to think about your claim to fame when you were a kid. And it's another way to get at these memories with a bit of a different perspective. And these memories I'm talking about hold a lot of those hidden gems, little secrets, little things you forgot about, little clues to help you get more insight into what makes you tick and what makes you happy. So let's get started with defining what I mean by claim to fame. A claim to fame is something that you're famous or well-known for. So maybe when you were a kid, it's not really about fame, like in quotes, but it's something that people think is interesting about you, something like that. It might even be seen as an important part of your personality or something that you've done that was important. 
Now, like I said, I'm talking about childhood claim to fame. So when it comes to being famous, I'm talking about, you know, what would have made you famous when you were a kid, maybe in the schoolyard or, you know, in a class or in your neighborhood. So it's like being famous in quotes. I'm doing air quotes right now. (laughs) It's really, think about it as more of like your special sauce. That's really what it's about. Your special skill or a special talent or a special experience that people knew you for, even if it was your grade three class or the gals in your brownie troop. (laughs) Remember that? I totally do. So as I'm bringing this up and putting it into context, what are you thinking about? What was your claim to fame? Now, if you're drawing a blank, let me tell you uh, what a claim to fame was for me. So I have a couple of them here and I can really see the linkages. So I think you'll be able to really be inspired by this. The first thing I thought of with a claim to fame reference was definitely our giant dogs growing up when I was a kid. So we had St. Bernard's, like Beethoven, and not just one either. We had five of them. And they were so memorable, such a huge part of my childhood. My parents got into breeding St. Bernard's, like having the puppies and everything. And we also did the dog show thing. And I even showed the youngest one, that was Brandy, in the puppy class when I was only about 11 or 12-ish. Now, why was this claim to fame? You might be asking, because this was something my parents got us into. Well, Facebook has kind of brought this to my attention. I have heard this from several of my childhood friends who have reached out to me through Facebook. And it's amazing what stories they remember, what memories they have. Some good memories, like when my dad used to bring the biggest one, whose name was Mr. Jack, into class elementary school for show and tell. <laughs> he really did that. And kids remembered it because, you know, he's, he was huge. He was well over 200 pounds. He's way bigger than my current dog, who's a big guy. It was memorable. So there were lots of good memories that came from the kids <laughs> from childhood, the midlife 59-year-olds now, <laughs> and also some not so great memories, like sometimes the kids were afraid. There were some incidents, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, maybe a kid, I, I heard one story where the kid told me, the adult, when he told me this, that he remembers almost getting bowled over because these big dogs, when they move around, sometimes you can get easily get knocked over. I've fallen on walks. It happens. <laughs> so, you know, there were all kinds of memories. Not every but he loves a large dog. It's uncomfortable for some, and it's fascinating and wonderful for others. Now, another claim to fame also came from elementary school way back when I remember being one of four winners of a fire prevention poster contest. And it was in grade three or grade four. I can't quite remember. I think it was grade three. Um, But yeah, I remember that. And I was quite proud of myself for making a poster that won a prize. We got like a plaque. And that leads me to the memory of being the one who was chosen to paint the junior high logo on a big rock at the front of the junior high school. And the creativity theme followed me into high school when I was always the one doing calligraphy, making the ads for the saxophone section in the band program for our big night of sound. And that's night K-N-I-G-H-T because we were called the marching night. So every year we had this big cavalcade of sound. It was a nighttime performance. And you know, the uh, the program took ads and I was always the one to create those ads by hand. And it was a lot of fun. And I was known for that. I was also the one painting the giant, giant signs for the sides of the buses whenever the band traveled. And eventually in 1981, I was surprised when I saw my yearbook and was voted one of the two most creative students in my high school class. We graduated in 81 and there was a guy and a girl and I was the girl and, uh, you know, it was amazing. And I I remember being surprised by that. I mean, I I remember taking the picture, (laughs) but I remember being surprised that it had happened at all. So with these examples, the two things that pop out are my love of dogs and my love for being creative. Do you see what I'm getting at? If you are a listener of this podcast, 
these two things, these insights probably won't surprise you. These two things hold clues to what's really important to me, what has brought me joy, and what I absolutely wanted more of in my life. I do want more of this in my life. Absolutely. But I didn't always completely understand that. I've been on a quest since I turned 50, so in the last nine years, to do just that. When it comes to the dogs, it's interesting. I ended up doing my master's thesis on the relationship between children and their pet dogs. So that was in the 80s. When I was single and dating back in the 80s and early 90s, I would even ask my new dates if they had any allergies. I was looking for a pet allergy because that just wouldn't be okay. Grass allergy? Okay. (laughs) Pollen? I could cope with that. But a pet allergy? Not so much. Then when I got married, we had a beautiful golden retriever named Yofi, followed by another amazing golden retriever named Jasper. So we had goldens in our family life for 20 years. And when I turned 50, I did a lot of reflection. And I realized that something I really, really wanted was that big dog experience from childhood for my kids. I wanted that too. Now, my kids were teenagers by then, but I had such fond memories of the claim to fame and the meaning of having that size of a dog in your life and their personality and the kind of family things that happen as a result of having a a large dog and how people just love to meet a large dog and they're fascinated by it. Like I call my husband a chick magnet. He has never gotten more attention than he has by walking Nico. (laughs) So even though the kids were older, at that point, our first kid had gone to university, the first of the three kids. Um, That's when we got Nico the Newfoundland. And a Newfoundland is very similar to St. Bernard's. I mean, not the same Newfs or water rescue dogs. And, um, you know, for our lifestyle, that worked better. But a lot of people think he's a St. Bernard. And also, um, you know, the size is very similar. They're bred for different things. They have different skills. (laughs) But anyway, we have Nico the Newf and he's awesome. And he was an amazing choice. And that was a very intentional thing based on thinking about all this stuff. So when it comes to creativity, it's always been important for me too. It started with calligraphy when I was 12. And that really opened the door for me. I had never taken formal art training, but I was given a book and I remember studying the book. Like I really did letters and letters and alphabets and alphabets and and I filled pads and pads of paper with practice um, calligraphy. I was just practicing like crazy. I loved it. It was absolutely fascinating for me. But like I mentioned, I never really had formal art training or took courses until very recently. I've always loved photography and I've been making things with my hands. Like this is consistent. I've been taking pictures, eventually getting good cameras and making things with my hands for decades now. Cake decorating was something I got into for a while and making realistic looking edible fondant flowers. Fimo clay jewelry was something I totally got into for a while. Beaded wire kipas and pendants. As you know, I I loved that for a very long time and still love that. Um, And I was making those kippahs, our Jewish head coverings, and I make a beaded wire, very artsy looking version of that. And that's what got me into the Museum of Modern Art for that very special exhibit in 2017 called Items is Fashion Modern. Just crazy, like a crazy opportunity. And it all came from this stream of things I was attracted to when it comes to being creative. Now, I didn't think of myself as an artist. I, Like I said, I never had any formal training. I never took courses, but I was always attracted to it. And I found my way into little courses, not programs, here and there as I got older, like I said very recently. And then in my 50s, I stepped on the gas where creativity was concerned. Just like with getting a big dog, I started to sense that I needed to focus on this more. So, like I mentioned, I started to take some art classes here and there. I discovered encaustic painting along the way. That's painting with wax. Super fun. But the real challenge came last year. As a life coach, 
I always incorporated a little bit of creativity into the retreats that I hosted and then more recently. Now, I would say that coaching is creative. It's a creative business. It's a creative process. But what I'm referring to is more obvious creativity. So I incorporated the arts and mixed media into the retreats. Now, I only had three retreats before the pandemic, (laughs) Um, but it was something that was a priority for me and I couldn't imagine doing it any other way. So what happened somewhere along the way in my 50s, I discovered something called the Zentangle Method. I don't know if you're familiar with Zentangle, but it is, uh, it's a, a type of mindful doodling, but it's something that has really taken hold and become more popular and people are finding it and loving it. So what it is, it's an easy to learn, relaxing and fun way to create beautiful images by drawing structured patterns. You don't need a lot of tools. You don't need a lot of resources. You need a pen you need a pencil, you need a type of paper, and the nicer the paper, the better. Um, That's basically it, like a pencil sharpener. (laughs) You don't need much. It's simple. It's simple to travel with. I love it. But the main reason I became interested in it, you can kind of see why I was always a doodler with the calligraphy and everything. and, And I have always loved pen and paper and ink. Like I've always been into that sort of stuff. But what I could see with the Zentangle method is that it promotes focus, creativity, and well-being. And I was fascinated with it and started to see how it was a great fit with my kind of coaching practice. So during the pandemic, I became what they call a CZT, a certified Zentangle teacher, and have now incorporated mindful doodling like this into my signature group program, the Women in the Middle Academy, to help you develop skills that promote relaxing and getting into flow way more often. Because as we know, well, maybe you don't know, (laughs) this kind of thing is really important to help you get unstuck. These skills of relaxing, slowing down, understanding how to think, noticing your thoughts, getting into flow, being open to what's possible, all this stuff absolutely helps you get unstuck. It really does. Like I hear so often that my amazing women in the middle, perhaps you're one of these amazing women in the middle, I have a feeling you are, have a hard time reading a book these days. We feel very commonly, we feel too busy to read a book. And, you know, I'm guilty of this. I catch myself thinking I'm too busy to do all kinds of things. So, Like I said, this is one of the reasons that I knew that this particular thing would be perfect for me to be a certified Zentangle teacher and to really help the women in my community, to help my clients learn these skills so that they can open themselves up to applying more of this kind of stuff to their lives. Now, I'm telling you all of this so you can really see how reflecting on being curious about your claim to fame as a kid could be quite relevant to you now. It's pretty obvious with me, and I think it will be pretty obvious with you too. Now, I know it can be kind of weird sometimes when it comes to thinking about your passion, thinking about your purpose, all of that kind of stuff in midlife. Somewhere along the line at this age, it's common to start to feel off, not content. You buy the books, you listen to the podcasts, and you know that being fulfilled is more important at this point in your life. Like, you know it. It's everywhere. You, if you're on Pinterest, you see it everywhere, too. And you start to think that you should have a passion project or something like that anchoring your life. You also got the message that you need to find your purpose to be happy. But then it's pretty common to feel flummoxed, bewildered, perplexed drawing a blank, weirdly confused about something that you think you should know about yourself. I was confused too. I think a lot of the confusion, however, is because you think it's something that you don't know about yourself. Now, let me repeat that because I really think that this is part of the problem. This whole purpose and passion thing, I need to find my passion, I need to find my purpose, gets you really confused when you can't connect with it. 
And then you start to think, I should be able to connect with it. I should know that about myself. You start to think you don't know it about yourself because it's something new. But I think you can see with me, my experiences that I shared, it's stuff that I knew. So what's the problem? It felt like I didn't know it because I hadn't applied it to my life yet in a way that was really fulfilling and meaningful as an older midlife gal. I understood the trees, the individual things, events, and ideas, but I didn't understand the forest, the big picture. I I love that trees and forest analogy. It comes up a lot. So I could see what was going on individually speaking, but I didn't put it all together, and I didn't really understand how important it was for me going forward. Now I can see it. It's clear. The purpose and passion hack helped me. And it's a hack because it's a shortcut to finding the forest. By reconnecting with your childhood claim to fame, you hack your way to the trees, not hack the tree. No hacking of trees. You hack your way to the trees. (laughs) Then to get yourself to the forest, you have to apply what you've reflected about and noticed to your age and stage now. So once you get in the forest, you have to apply what you've reflected on and learned and apply it to your life now. So specifically, ask yourself these six simple questions to help navigate this, okay? Question one, what was my childhood claim to fame? Question two, why did this matter to me as a kid? Question three, Do I still connect with this? Question four, how can I bring more of it into my life now, personally and professionally? Question five, what could this mean for me in terms of leaning in to my purpose? And question six, what could this mean for me in terms of leaning into my passion? So briefly, here they are again. One, what was my childhood claim to fame? Two, why did this matter to me as a kid? Three, do I still connect with this? Four, how can I bring more of this into my life now, personally and professionally? Five, what could this mean for me in terms of leaning into my purpose? And six, what could this mean for me in terms of leaning into my passion? That's it, my friend. I love these six simple questions for you. They are a super duper simple hack into your heart, mind, body, and soul. Your childhood claim to fame could just be the source of some pretty awesome inspiration to a more fulfilling and fun next chapter. Keep me posted about what insights you have when you play with this idea. I can't wait to see your email. Absolutely. Okay, that is it for this episode. As you know, my focus as your midlife coach is to help you get unstuck, clear, and excited about your life again. If you want to find out more about how to get unstuck and live your best life in the middle, make sure to watch my free midlife training at www.midlifevideo.com and you will get immediate access to what I like to call the secret to your midlife happiness plan. If you're ready to change your life and learn the skills to unstick yourself with some masterful coaching, a top-notch curriculum, an infusion of creativity, and a warm, fun, and awesome community of like-minded women, Let's talk. I would love for you to be able to get unstuck and find that thing you're looking for. Go ahead and book your momentum call at www.womeninthemiddleacademy.com. For show notes and links, head over to www.susierosenstein.com and click the podcast tab and look for episode 272. Thanks so much for listening. It's time for you to put yourself first, one thought at a time. I'm Susie Rosenstein, and I'll talk to you next week.